We've heard from a lot of world-class speakers over the last few days, presenting some of their incredibly inspiring and emotionally moving work. Well, I'm here today, this afternoon, to, tell, to empower you, to tell you it's your turn. You can do it as well. And I want to show with you some tips and tricks that I've learned over the last um, decade that will hopefully empower you to go out and make some of your own incredibly inspiring images and bring back some incredibly inspiring stories. My hope is that I'm able to impart a new way of improving your nature photography, or perhaps simply to inspire you to get out and explore and reconnect with the natural world. Many of us spend far too much time indoors nowadays, and it's time to change that. Oops, sorry, went slide. Uh-oh. Sorry, I hit the wrong button. Okay, sorry about that. Ah. The notes aren't moving. Okay, here we go. Don't worry, I don't use notes the whole presentation, just the beginning, just so I don't forget to certain things. My advice to you is really quite simple. Get curious, go outside, and bring your camera. Explore and reconnect with the natural world. Create images that inspire others to go outside and have their own experiences. The more we can encourage others to reconnect with the nature, the greater our chance for conserving it will be. This afternoon, I'd like to share with you some photographic tips and a few shooting scenarios, and I'll take you through my thought process, I'll show you some bad images, and I'll show you how I got to the better images. And while many of the landscapes and wildlife that inhabit them are very far away, many of them, you know, many of these tips can be used in your own backyard. I'm a big believer that there's a lot of beauty and a lot of stories to be told in our own backyards, and you don't have to travel far to make those beautiful images and moving stories. I'll let you in on a little secret. During this presentation, you'll see a lot of images that look like they might have been shot while I was waiting in a blind for weeks on end, being bitten by mosquitoes, hoping for that rare glimpse of the animal to appear. Um, but they were instead, most likely what would have happened is that they were taken on a National Geographic Lindblad expedition where I slept in a really comfortable bed. I woke up and I had a delicious breakfast. I got in a Zodiac and I cruised out to some incredibly remote, beautiful destination where I walked with the finest naturalists, expedition leaders, historians, geologists, and photo, photo instructors that you could ever hope to have with you while traveling on a remote, in a remote location. I'm very grateful to be here representing Lindblad Expeditions, and I'd personally like to thank Carolyn DeMonico for inviting me to be here, so thank you. For many of us, photography is the vehicle that gets us outside and connecting with nature. Like a hunter bringing back a prize trophy, we go out pre-dawn hours in hopes of having a chance encounter with the beasts in the wild or a beautiful lit landscape. I've structured this talk into a series of topics and I hope it illustrates the techniques that I'm, I'm going to show you over the next 40 minutes. Many of these topics might not be new to you. I mean, after all, this is landscape and wildlife photography. This is a very well-loved subject, a very well-talked about subject, but perhaps you'll find a nugget or two within the talk, so let's get started. Wildlife photography, what is one of the first things we think about when we're gonna photograph nature and wildlife? Well, first of all, we probably think, well, where is it, right? How do we find this, this animal? But the second thought might be, how are we gonna freeze it, right? How are we gonna freeze the action? So this, an, this is a blue-footed booby diving into the ocean. Uh, we had gotten up early, did a sunset photo, or sunrise photo walk, and uh, the blue-footed boobies were diving into the ocean. And I knew that I wanted to freeze it at that moment of impact. And so I'm using incredibly fast shutter speed. I want you to think about using higher ISOs. A lot of you like to use really low ISOs. You're, you're, you're thinking in terms of old film days where you gotta use ISO 100 or 200. Um, it's rare that I photograph wildlife under ISO 800. Even on a sunny, sunny day. Trust me, I would love to shoot on ISO 100, but that's just not the case if I really want to capture the action. And so let me show you a series of, of images that kind of highlight that. Again, Scarlet Macaw, we're in Costa Rica now. We're spending the morning with Scarlet Macaws. A, a, a several pair come down and feed on these beech almond trees. This is a rare instance where something that has been introduced, the beech almond tree, is a, is a good food source for the animal. And it's, it's not native there, but they've been feeding and it's helping them with their comeback. 
In my own backyard, this is Skyline Drive. I live very close um, to Skyline Drive, about 45 minutes away, and this is a barred owl taking flight, probably at ISO 2000. And here we have a black flying fox, and this is in the Kimberley in Australia. And then we we're back in Costa Rica. And just as, sun, as the sun was setting, I could hear that little chirp of the hummingbird, and up he popped. I love photographing backlit subjects. I think it's incredibly beautiful light, and I'm always looking for scenes like that. Now, typically we're, you know, we're talking about fast shutter speeds, well, what about slow shutter speeds? Well, you can do that as well. And so, we'll start off with an image of my dog, Sasha. She's a rescue greyhound. And uh, this is not as fast, but she's a, if you ever want to practice photography, find, you know, find a greyhound. Don't go to the tracks, don't support them. But go find somebody that has a greyhound and ask them if you can go photograph their dog running around. Um, she, we clocked her once at 32 miles an hour. That was after she had stopped racing. They're beautiful animals and wonderful dogs. Um, but I want to show you the difference between something where you freeze the action at 640th of a second and a 30th of a second where you're showing motion, right? It's, for me, something, you've heard this earlier as well, someone mentioned this and I can't remember who, but it, something has to be sharp in a panned image. And ideally for me, it's the eye, it's the face that, that needs to be sharp. I like that, it, it helps anchor the image. This is my daughter running in a sunflower field near our house. And I wanted to show motion. I wanted to show energy. And I wanted to show the beautiful scene that I was seeing. If you photograph kids or grandkids, you want to make it fun for them, right? And so my focus is on her. And I'm using a 40th of a second. And I'm just race I'm running behind her. I made it a game. Here we are in Tortuguero, it's a beautiful park, the national park in Costa Rica, and in this instance, I wanted to show a slow shutter speed to show the motion of the, the leaves flying past, and you'll notice that you'll notice it the most on the right side of the frame. Um, the boat itself is sharp, that's where the focus is, and I'm following behind in the boat, and I'm just, you know, using my um, burst rate, and I'm just shooting off a lot of these, and one of them is gonna work, and I'm looking for that corner, that kind of S-curve, to give me a little leading line. And here we are, this is in uh, South Georgia, and we have some elephant seals, and if you go early in the season, um, you can see these elephant seals, these males fighting on the beach. Um, and I thought, you know, I, can, yeah, I did freeze the action, but I also wanted to show motion in it, right? And so I used a 30th of a second and a wide angle. All right, the group photo, right? We all, you know, photographing one animal can be tough. What about lots of animals, right? Well, sometimes you get this, the rare four-winged giant petrel <laughs> on every birder's list, right? Or you get this, the four-winged blue-footed booby, right? And this is not what we want, right? No, of course not. We want separation, right? We want to show them separated from each other or se separate and separated from the background. When I was doing an assignment for the National Geographic Kids Books, I went to Kenya, Tanzania, and the Galapagos. And um, before I went, the editor told me, we don't want photos of animals' butts, <laughs> right? We don't want photos of them leaving, right? And so I've always remembered that anytime I photograph any animal. Now, I'm sure there's a market somewhere, but <laughs> typically it's not, right? So we are looking for separation. Now this was in Scotland, and I actually liked the leading line, and I was curious where they were gonna go. And then they walked along the ridge, and they created this beautiful, you know, they were walking along that, that trail there, and it was nice to see some separation. Now, obviously, these are sheep. This is a lot easier, right? And they're lambs, so they're, they're gonna follow their mother. And so typically when we photograph wildlife, you know, these are Gen 2 penguins in the Falklands, and you get this, right? Somebody's not, they haven't got the whole message, right? And uh, you've got to wait for that shot. You've got to be patient, and hopefully you can get something where you get separation. Now, if I'm going to be critical, that guy at the end on the right, he's not holding his weight, right? <laughs> no, his head should be up a little bit more. I was very disappointed with him. Another thing I like to do when I go to some of these destinations is I like to bring a GoPro. I set it up, I don't do video, I do a time lapse. I put it next to, in this case, if I'm down in Antarctica, I'll put it next to a penguin highway, 
And I'm not looking for necessarily the time lapse itself, but I'm looking for some interesting image that I can pull out of that time lapse later on. So I set it, and I forget it, and I go and shoot. And then I come back later, and hopefully I've remembered to bring it when we leave the destination, right? All right, monkeys in a barrel. Look at these guys, right? Like, you couldn't, you couldn't, you know, dream up a scenario where monkeys are hanging onto each other, hanging off of a tree. This is in Costa Rica. These are squirrel monkeys, also known as titi monkeys. And just, like, that's just being lucky and just having the camera ready to capture the, 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 the moment, right? Here we are in the Serengeti. This was during my animal encyclopedia assignment, and a crocodile had just taken a zebra foal, causing the stampede. And when that happened, I got this beautiful, um, you know, moment where all the, they had all stampeded, and that all that cloud, that cloud of sand and dust, kind of hid all the distracting background, and you get a moment, right? Sometimes the interaction could be between two separate species, right? This is in the Galapagos, These, this is what happens. These are brown pelicans. That same morning you saw the image that I opened with, with the, the blue-footed booby diving. The brown pelicans were also diving. They're fabulous to watch. They're the only brown pelicans that actually dive into the sea for the food. And that's a brown knotty sitting on its head, waiting for that moment where it can steal a fish out of its mouth, right? You know, Allison had shown her, our, you know, she, Allison Wright had given a presentation yesterday, and, and in it she showed a slide, Are You My Mother? And I actually have an Are You My Mother moment as well. I, this is a, a book that my daughter reads to me, but this is actually a, a newborn, couple day old fur seal um, pup that had come up to an elephant seal. So that is not its mother. And he w the elephant seal was sleeping and was not very impressed with this newborn fur seal. So, um, finding focus. When I photograph wildlife, where is my focus going to be? Where am I photographing? The eye, right? That's where we, anything that's living, that's where my focus is all the time. And my focus, I'm always using single point focus. I never let the camera decide where the focus goes. I choose my focus point for everything. And in this case, with this animal, and I put the apertures on here. I wanted you to see the apertures because I want to show you what you can do if you're focusing on the eyes. That was F8. Here's a blue-footed booby. F6.3. This is a Waggler's Pit Viper in Borneo. F5.6. Green iguana in Costa Rica. F4.5. Texture, detail. This is a basilisk or a Jesus Christ lizard because of their ability to run across water. Now this is in the middle of Tortuguero jungle. F3.5. Now, if I let the camera choose the focus point, what's it going to grab? It's going to grab the branch, right? Maybe it'll grab the heliconia, the flower, but it's not going to grab the, the animal. And I can't use a, a wide aperture, which is going to give me a faster shutter speed. And look at this. F1.8, Galapagos. This is, did you think you could photograph wildlife at F1.8? You can. And if you're in the Galapagos, you can use a 50 millimeter lens. So think about that next time you go, if you're ever planning a trip, is you can actually bring some of the smaller lenses with the wider apertures. That's something, you know, you wouldn't want to get out of the vehicle and photograph lines with a 50 millimeter lens. <laughs> so wildlife photography beyond portraits, right? We don't just want to show animals just as portraits. It's nice to photograph an animal and just get a beautiful portrait, but that's not all we want to do, right? Here's a nice portrait of an Adelie penguin. It's snowing, it's a nice scene, it's looking at me. I'm, I'm happy with that image. But this is more fun, isn't this? This is a, the, he, he's tobogganing, he's, they're sledding, right? And it's snowing and you can see the snow built up on the, the wings. And that to me is a little bit more interesting. Or getting them in a row coming towards you, right? There's a nice separation here, I think, between all the, the heads. or diving into the ocean, right? These are, these are creatures that spend most of their time in the ocean, so we need to show that part of the story as well. We were also fortunate to have been down there when we had some, I mean, this is a first look. This is a, this is a newborn Adeli. This is that parent seeing that Adeli penguin for the first time. It is incredibly amazing to be there. If I have to recommend one place for you folks to ever go visit, it is Antarctica. And if you have the time and the inclination, you need to go to South Georgia as well. 
It is an incredibly amazing place. Here are the Adelie penguins. They've finished with the day's excursion and they're going back to the National Geographic Orion for the lunch buffet. <laughs> so it's important to show that. You need a closing scene, right? So wildlife and, la and landscape photography, let's talk about how you choose, how to create depth, right? How to choose, I always know when I'm photographing my subject, what, I know what my subject is, I always know that. But I, I, I need to, my next process is what, what's behind the subject and what's in front of the subject, right? So I'm always thinking about adding depth to this photography. Um, so you, here we have, um, this is a Gen 2 penguin colony. We're in South Georgia right now. You can see it's a, it's a small colony. And you can see how if we move around, right? These are, these are um, obviously penguin chicks. You can see one's a little bit bigger, a little bit older than the other one. Clearly he's gonna be in charge and get more of the food, right? Because it can reach it easier. But if we move around, do you see, do you see that nice green? It's that's just by moving around. This is all from that same penguin colony. And here's another image. These were all made within five minutes of each other, right? And this is just by moving. You need to move, you need to be active, you need to be hunting for those images, right? Here we are, this is um, on fast ice. We actually park the ship, believe it or not, we actually take our ship and we drive it into ice. Doesn't that sound crazy? Why would you do that? Well, because we have an ice class vessel and when we do that, we let down the gangway and we go out and we have champagne and we trek around and we see wildlife sometimes. And uh, in this case, we have a Gen 2 penguin and I saw, you know, the one on the left is fine, it works. It's nothing special, but I, want, I saw the full moon and I thought, God, I'd love to include that. So I hiked away so I could z then zoom in and include the moon on it. Here is a big male elephant seal. You can see it's applying its SPF. My wife is always giving me a hard time because I don't put enough SPF on my daughter or myself. And so you can see what they're doing here. They're applying that, that to keep themselves cool. I'm looking for separation. That's a little bit busy for me, right? In the background. So I tried a little separation. That doesn't work for me. That's not a good image. But I get down low, right? and I'm getting a nice separation, nice clean background, and that works for me. I got a call at 2.30 in the morning. So this is the Gerlach Strait in Antarctica. It doesn't get dark when you're there. So you have beautiful twilight for hours on end. This is a photographer's dream, right? My friend Michael Nolan, who's a photo instructor for Lindblad Expedition, said, you gotta get up here, we're passing an iceberg and there's the full moon, it's just above it. And so we went up and, uh, and that's the beauty of photography, right? Michael could have just taken that, that photo himself, right? He sells stock, but he's, no, he, he wanted to share the moment. He knew it was an important moment. And, um, and then that's the moment, that's the shot I wanted, it, right as it hit that peak of the iceberg. You saw the image earlier, but this is the image before the image, right? I knew I wanted to photograph the sun as it was coming up, but I wanted to make it big and, and bright and beautiful, and I had that vision before I went to Africa. I don't know if I watched The Lion King too many times or what, but anyways, I, I waited till that moment happened. And that, that sun looks huge because I'm using a big lens. I'm shooting with the 500 f4 lens, and it's pulling that sun in, right? It's compressing. It's a compressing that landscape, and I love to photograph landscapes with telephoto lenses. You don't need to shoot with wide angles all the time. All right, so what about the foreground subject, right? Well, here we are in Garibaldi Glacier, and there was this incredible rainbow on the surface of the water. I had never seen that before. It was amazing. This is in Chile, on, uh, rounding the Cape um, from Chile to Argentina. It's an incredible incredible landscapes if you ever take that trip. And so you could see the rainbow on the, on the, on the surface of the water, and I, I said, oh my God, we need to get something interesting in the foreground. Now you might think, well, that's all interesting, right? But to me, there wasn't enough there. I needed some, you know, we, so I asked Santiago, our, our naturalist, I said, can we move a little bit further? And then I thought, isn't this great to put some nice, beautiful blue ice in the foreground? Here we are, this is the Cori Concha in Cusco. Beautiful church, um, and it's, 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 you know, you've got this nice street there, and you know, that could work as an image, but I didn't want to show people, and so I got down low, and I got in the, to, into the flowers so I could hide that. It's very easy to hide a lot of 
or add foreground elements depending on what you want to do. Here's Tortuguero, I was just there in February, and there's a lot, this is a, a lot of waterways, right? And so there's the image of the boat driving past, but I also thought it'd be good to include some people to show another layer of interest. And then I saw something else and I thought, oh, wouldn't this be cool? Here's a, a frame, and let me see if I can get a boat and the people and the sunset. And um, if I have to give myself a hard time, I should have had a little separation between the heads and the boat, but I was just having fun. Um, reflections, I'm always looking for reflections, right? And I'm always looking for natural reflections like this. This is why you go to Antarctica, folks. Look at that. Just these beautiful, Ralph said it, the ice, right? You go for the ice. As much as the wildlife is amazing, the ice is just otherworldly. And to see it, you know, at, at twilight, and to sail in between that while you're seeing penguins porpoise, it's a moment that will reside with me until I die. It's a, an amazing, amazing place. I'm also looking for it with wildlife. This is just a puddle next to the fur seal. And penguins, right? Recently I was in DC. I live in Virginia, but DC is very close by. And I was shooting with Michael Nolan again, actually. And this is the tidal basin. You go to the tidal basin, you want to get a photo of the Jefferson Memorial. It's a very standard shot. And um, if you photograph the tidal basin at night, most likely there's a current or there's wind, and that's what you get. But if you are looking around, you might find puddles, right? That's why somebody said yesterday, if it's raining, get outside. Go, you know, especially after a rain, if you don't want to get wet, and use the, you know, look for the puddles, because then you can get images. And the puddles don't have to be big. Look at how small that puddle is. Look for humor. This is, I mean, I wish the sign was still there. This was in Ireland about a decade ago. Jonathan Irish had some great signs. Um, but signs are great. What about this one? Do you want to use that room? I, I, don't, I don't, no matter which option it is. <laughs> Can you imagine now, how many times, how many times are you looking at your phone, not paying attention, going to the bathroom or whatever? Can you imagine not paying attention and going to use that? That's a public restroom. A Komodo dragon, holy cow. You know you've had too much to drink if you wake up in Ireland and that's the scene you see, right? And again, this is, just, this is one of those time lapses, folks. This is very easy, you know? Just set it and forget it and then come back and check it later. So forget the gap, mind the edges. I'm very critical of distracting elements um, around the edges of a scene. I'm always looking for you know, a clean composition that's not going to be distracting. And so, this is on, on the assignment I did for Nat Geo Kids books. You can see, um, it's a great scene, but I have to give myself a hard time because of that branch. Do you see that one branch? Now, you can easily crop it out, right? But guess what? If you crop it out, you're losing something, right? You're, we're losing pixels here. And I could, that's easily something I could have fixed when I shot it originally. <coughs> Here's a puffin uh, landing on Fair Isle. You can see I've clipped the wing at the end, right? That to me, eh, it's almost there. It's almost, it's almost a really great image and then it's just shy. So vertical deficit disorder. I think a lot of us have this, right? We see beautiful horizontal landscapes. Here we are in Skyline Drive. And then we forget to take the vertical, but there's lots of great verticals out there. We're so used to shooting. Think about, think about you folks who use smartphones all the time. How many of you record video vertically? Because that's how you hold the phone, right? And how many of you shoot when you hold the camera horizontally? That's what you shoot. It's just because of how it feel, feels comfortable in your hands. You've got to get yourself out of the habit. You have to look for scenes both horizontally and vertically. This was in the parking lot. We were just did the Great Britain Ireland trip. I just got back two weeks ago. This was at a, a famous, really important archaeological site called Sutton Hoo. This was in the parking lot, next to the parking lot. This was in beautiful soft light. This, the blue, bluebells are just so spectacular in the spring. But there's lots of beautiful verticals out there to go get them. Sense of place. So we always want to get in tight and get that shot, that really beautiful shot that kind of fills the frame of the animal. But you know what? That, unless you're an orc, you know, a biologist 
that deals with orcas, you're not going to know where those are from. But if you pull back, it, you can go, oh my god, they're in one of the polar regions, most likely Antarctica, right? Same thing here, we've got a giraffe, some oxpecker birds on it, and that's, you know, it works as a portrait. And then you pull back and you show where the animal was. Show a sense of place, folks. So do we still need fil filters? So, by full disclosure, I'm sponsored by Tiffin, but to be fair, I used them for many, many years before they sponsored me, and I just wrote them an email and said, hey, I love your filters, I've been using it for so long, I think you should send me some more. And so, <laughs> so they did, they don't pay me, but they send me some, some fun stuff to play with. So this is in Scotland, this is a Nat Geo hiking adventure that we did, and uh, this is uh, the Kerrang, and I love to shoot into the sun. Early in the day, late in the day, I'm always looking for that backlit subject, and I'm using a graduated ND filter, a neutral density filter here, right? Same thing here, this is the Kerry Cliffs, County Kerry, Ireland. And this is on the island of, Isle of Carrera in Scotland. If you don't use graduated ND filters, many times those skies would be burned out. I like it when you have a really moody sky too, it helps kind of make it a little bit more dramatic. And that's in the Beagle Channel on the southern tip of South America. I also will use polarizers with wildlife. You probably wouldn't think to do that, but if you look at that image, there's a lot of burned out highlights on the leaves, and there is a little bit, not much, on the animal itself, but very often wildlife will have burned out spots on them because of the fact of how reflective either their fur is or whatever, their skin itself. And so using a polarizer, you can see that the highlights, they're, they're fine. They look beautiful on those orangutan right there, right? And same thing on the leaves. There's no burned out highlights in this image. I use ND filters. This is on a Nat Geo student adventures trip. And this is up in the Mindo in the cloud forest. With an ND filter, you're able to get longer exposures. This is 30 seconds. And this is by my house, Great Falls National Park. 30 seconds as well. This one was actually, one of the things I love about using a multi-layer, the square system, is that you can stack them. You can put an ND and a graduated ND to balance the sky, right? The ND filter is to create the slow motion. The graduated ND is to keep from burning out the sky. But you can't do that with circular, polar, you know, circular filters because what happens is you get this, right? You get a big, giant vignette. But if you use a square system or a vertical, there's several manufacturers out there that do it. Wildlife photography, so details. We don't always need to show the whole animal, do we? Right? We can just show the feet. This is, you clearly, you know, that's a blue-footed booby. Here's a Nazca booby waiting on its egg to hatch. Or just perhaps footprints, right? These are or penguin footprints in South Georgia. Framing your image. I'm always looking for frames. We all know this technique. It's a very common technique. And, um, you know, this is just a local park near my house. Folks, we have so many local, underutilized either city parks or county parks or state parks. You know, in the state of New York, there's 200 state, there's 200 state parks and historic sites. That's amazing. That's just the state of New York. These parks are underutilized. Get out there. They're beautiful. This is the Galapagos. I'm just using the sides of this cave to, to frame that subject. And this is a land iguana in, um, in the Galapagos, just a piece of that cactus, a window from that cactus. Here we are in the Kimberley in Australia, and you can see I'm using the people in this instance to frame those sharks that are in between them and the ship. Now, those aren't dangerous sharks, but I thought it was interesting. You could photograph your own backyard. And this is just lightning striking. I'm using, this is a very common technique, use a window, use a door, use a frame a naturally built frame. This is a helicopter crash in South Georgia. And this is an old farmhouse in Valencia, in Ireland. So show scale. Um, when I was a young photographer, I know I might look young, but I'm actually almost 40, I'll be 40 this year. 
um, but show scale, right? And if I used to hate when people would walk into my scene. I know you're, you're all guilty of this. I know you are, right? You've all, you curse, come on, get out of my scene. I need to get this shot, right? Well, you know what? One of the things I learned, people are really good in your scene to show scale. You wouldn't know how big that cliff is. This is in the Kimberley Coast. Those of you that love geology, my God, you need to go out to the Kimberley Coast in Australia. It's amazing. And this is up in Alaska, misty fjords. If you didn't have that kayaker, you would have no idea how tall those waterfalls are. And there are, I mean, there are just thousands of them everywhere, just, you know, in the springtime, just pouring into the ocean. We, you know, Ralph showed some of the images where, you know, you could see the, you know, we all want to get the image of, you know, the calving, but it's also important to pull back and, and shoot and show the zodiacs and the people and the experience. Now this looks, what, it looks like they're gonna get crushed, right? That's, that's just compression with a telephoto lens. They're obviously at a very safe distance. Sometimes it's important to show the tree. You know, that's a really big tree, but you don't know unless you put the person next to it for scale, right? And this is my friend Chris Cook, who's a naturalist, a dive master. And uh, here we are in, in Raja Ampat, if you ever wanna go dive with us on the South Pacific. We have, there our Orion has diving on board, which is pretty awesome. And uh, Chris is a dive master. But take a look, on the left, giant clam, right? On the right, if you don't have the scale, you don't have a person there, that doesn't make sense of how big that giant clam actually is. So show an experience by adding people. This is the Paramo grasslands in Ecuador. And it's a beautiful area, but it doesn't show an experience. But by riding, uh, too quick. Sorry about that. There we go. But by take, showing, including the horse, showing the riders, you have an experience that you're there, you're on the horse, you're riding with them. That's an experience, that's what I wanna do. I wanna go ride that horse. Here is up in the same location. This is up in Cotopaxi. It's a beautiful area. And that's a nice scene, but I think having the student there, this was a student workshop that we did, and having that student, he's, this is, tells the story of a young photographer looking at the image, taking that, it's a moment, right? Here's some Adeli penguins. This is, a, you know, it's an okay scene in the middle of the day. I just like the, the vastness of this. But I think it's also important to pull back and show the fact that you can go kayak and see penguins from a kayak in Antarctica. Sunsets, sunsets and sunsets and sunsets. We all love to photograph sunsets, but we need to put something interesting in the sunsets, not just the sun, right? We've seen this a million times. So that is an okay scene. It's not one I really wanna take. I'd rather show this. That's excitement, that's adventure, that's a moment. Now, we were also going really fast and doing the same thing. So I have like 50 frames that are like up in the air and the water and just a big giant mess, but that's all right, I didn't have to show you those. This is in Ox Oxford, Maryland. This is just a pier, a beautiful sunset, and um, I didn't have anybody with me, right? So I just put it on a timer and I, I walked out and I was the person. So I showed you these tabular icebergs before. So these are beautiful, right? But I think this really shows the experience of what it was like to be there that night. The London Eye. This is photographed at sunset. If you're ever gonna go there and you wanna photograph from the London Eye, go at sunset, wear dark clothing. If you ever wanna photograph out of a plane or a bus or a car or wherever it is that you wanna photograph at an aquarium, what color should you wear? Black, very good. Yeah, you wear black because you don't wanna be reflecting into the glass, right? But if you pull back, you can also show the experience of what it's like to be up in the London Eye. So leading lines, we're always talking about leading lines and adding some interest to keep the eye within the frame, right? This is that same scene, the same night I showed you the, the sunset. I've never seen a sunset like that, it was spectacular. Sometimes you could put it straight in the middle and sometimes you could have it angle throughout the frame. I photographed Monticello for the state of Virginia for their guidebooks and uh, they told me they had these candlelight nights sometimes and I thought, oh my God, I would love to photograph that at nighttime. And there's just a simple leading line leading up to it. One of my favorite things to do, find a person, you know, a project that you can work on 
over and over and over again. One of mine is I just like to go out and drive the back roads near where I live. This is in Loudoun County, and I love to just drive these, these gravel roads looking for scenes like this in the fall or in this winter time when there's snow on them. And this is in Haida Gwaii. This is um, up near British Columbia. It's a UNESCO World ha Heritage Site. It's called Skong Gwaii. We do a trip there, and this was last May. And that's, you know, this leading line just takes me from right to left or left to right. So patterns in nature. Um, there's lots of patterns out there. There's lots of repeating patterns, and there's lots of color and texture. And I think we've seen a lot of great examples of that over these last few days. This is Gugambara in Ireland. It's beautiful. Most people go to Gugambara in County Cork. They go, they photograph the small little church, and then they leave. They might get a cup of tea and a scone, but then they leave. This is the forest. This is Ireland's first national park, and it was, it's right past the church, and nobody goes to it. It's beautiful. Look at this. It's like, you know, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, Middle Earth. This is the Giant's Causeway. These are hexagonal basalt columns. And uh, I just found that heart shape, and I thought, oh my god, that's beautiful. And these are all adult king penguins. One of the beauties of going to South Georgia is you can land on beaches where there are 200,000 three-foot-tall king penguins. It is an experience that is unreal. And you'll see all those, those brown spots are actually juveniles. They're called oakum boys. Um, and they are, they're fun to photograph. Some of them get these mullets as they're molting. They, get, they can look really ugly <laughs> and fun to photograph. But um, you can see these are repeating patterns, right? Just beautiful patterns. It's nice to move away and then zoom in, right? I had to climb up a cliff to get a shot like that. We're always looking to fill frames, right? I don't want a picture of a bird that's a pixel. You know, sometimes we call them, you know, you know birders get really excited when they see a bird that's like a mile away. And I just can't get excited unless I can fill the frame with the image of the bird. I'm happy to look at it through binoculars, but it's not a moment for me until I can actually capture it like that. This is an Antarctic turn. And this is a juvenile orangutan in, um, in Borneo. That's in a rehabilitation center, rescue center. And these are wild orangutans. and a king penguin in South Georgia. And he was very curious. Most of them didn't want to come up, but he came right up to us when we first landed. So adding light. We can always add light to a scene. I'll just have a couple quick examples of that. This is the cherry basin. You can see on the left, if I don't add light, that's the shot I get. This is at twilight. I popped the flash. I was just holding the flash, and I was just popping it. You can see there's movement, right? It was windy. So the wind is blowing the cherry blossoms around, and I'm just popping the flash. And sometimes you get great images, and most of the time you just get kind of ones you don't want to show anybody. They're, you want to delete them. This is light painting. This is in my wife's hometown of Milltown, County Kerry. And um, this is a 13th century abbey, Kalala Abbey. And just look at that. It's, it's a beautiful abbey. I love that window, and I thought it'd be great to go out at nighttime and photograph it. And this is a, a spookier looking church, isn't it? It's, this is called the White Church, and this would be a place that you would have dared your friends to go down at yeah, nighttime to stay over or whatever. You'd, you can actually see human bones in some of the crypts like, that are just hanging out. It's really amazing, but it's kind of an eerie place to go at nighttime. So dealing with mixed light, I have three scenarios for you, and then I'm going to wrap up. So Komodo National Park. Wow, look at that great image, right? That's not a great image. This is what happens, though, when you get to Komodo, and you're like, oh, my god, it's a Komodo dragon. And you're like, Kh. And I thought, oh, my god, that's horrible, right? But why am I showing you that? Well, because I want to show you how to deal with mixed light. There's another scene overexposed, right, because I'm exposing for the shadow, right? Now, you could crop that out, but that's, that's not what I wanted to do. That's not the shot I wanted. And then I, they came over, and they laid down, and they, they're really lazy. They were kind of laying there like lions. You know how lions sleep like 20 hours? I mean, they were just laying there, and I thought, oh, my God. You know, at least it's in, you know, light one, one shade. You know, either give me all shade or give me all, all light. And so they laid down, and I thought, oh, this is horrible. And then 
one got up and started coming towards me. And I thought, this is great. <laughs> My wife would probably disagree. And it started running. And look at that. Did you know they did that? Just on two legs, isn't that cool? And the big forked tongue, and that's what I was looking for, right? So I'm, I'm running, and I'm shooting, and then I'm running some more, and then shooting. And that's, that's what I wanted. I wanted to show all of that. And I got down low, right? I'm getting low so I can show that angle. They're not very tall. And then I got even lower because I saw that there was, remember I'm thinking about the background? I saw that there were some trees and I thought, I don't want just the brown, I want to show some greenery in the background. And then it was time to go. <laughs> <laughs> so working at Cloudy Sky, these next two series, scenarios are just from my recent trip when we did the circumnavigation of England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. And so this is working at Cloudy Sky. Sometimes you go to locations, right, and you, you, you want to be there at that magic hour, but you just can't make it happen, right? And so you've got to make the best of a situation. And this is a beautiful scene. It's not beautiful light. I would love to come back here at, you know, pre-dawn or around sunset or even at nighttime. But this is not what I had to work with, right? So I thought, all right, let me find a pop of color. Right? And there's, I got down really low and there were some beautiful wildflowers there. So I'm adding color to the scene. It distracts from that kind of boring gray sky. If you can notice, there's actually some horses off in the distance, which we'll get to in a second. And then I pull up a little bit more. I'm not liking it as much. I pull up a little bit more. I'm just getting the purple now, right? And I thought, all right, time to move on. And these are, these are wild, wild ponies. These are wild Welsh ponies that live there. And they were just kind of grazing around, but you could see this, the gorse. See that beautiful yellow flower? That's gorse. In the springtime, it's just beautiful, and it's everywhere. The farmers would disagree. They tend to burn it, but it is, it's, just, it's stunning to use as a backdrop for photographs. So the horse I'm using, I've got two cameras on me. So if you're curious how I shoot, I have, typically have one that's set up for wide-angle shots that are scene setters. My other camera is for photographing for telephotos, right? And so I, I pull out my telephoto, I get this scene. If you notice the difference between the two of these, see that sky again, very boring, very gray. And I'm not including it, I'm just getting the ocean. So we get a little bit darker color there, right? And I don't have a graduated ND filter like I do on these scenes. So take a look here. I'm getting excited because now they're coming closer. I've got my wide angle out. This is a horrible image. This is not good, but I wanted to show you. We all make mistakes and we all make bad photographs. I guarantee, well, Art Wolf probably told you, he makes, everyone makes bad images, right? But professionals, we don't like to show the bad stuff, but I think it's helpful to learn, right? So that's not a great image. Again, this is not a great image, but I'm, I'm working, hoping that I get something that works. And then I get a moment like this where the wind is blowing the mane and it's a nice scene and I'm very happy with that. There's nice separation with most of the animals. And then I get a little lower because I want to try a different angle. And I think that, that frame works as well. And then I saw this one horse, or one pony, and he was, you know, he kept doing this weird thing with his mouth, and I thought, oh my God, I'd love for him to do it one more time. So I got the telephoto ready, and I was lucky he did it one <laughs> more time, right? And that gorse is, it's not there by accident, right? That beautiful yellow, right? That's, it helps get rid of that distracting, any, a distracting background. It's a beautiful, it adds to the image, right? And then they walked away, thank God, because I would have spent the whole day there and missed the boat. Like, and so we kept on walking, right? And we had a great, great afternoon. <clears throat> this is the last, last scenario I'm gonna share with you. And that's, uh, I love landscapes and wildlife. They're probably my, aside from photographing my daughter, they're probably my two favorite subjects to photograph. And, you know, when you go to a place like Staffa Island, it is amazing. I don't know if any one of you have seen, Jim Richardson, a National Geographic photographer, has a beautiful image from Staffa with light coming out of Fingal's Cave. It's stunning. If you ever get a chance, take a look at it. But I want to show you the difference. So I had to make a decision. I only had a limited amount of time. And I had to make a decision. There are puffins on this island. We hadn't seen puffins yet. And I thought, oh my god, do I photograph the puffins or do I go for the landscape? Because look at this landscape. Look at that. It's amazing. Right? And so I thought, you know what? I'm going with the puffins. I, I just I had to photograph the puffins on a beautiful, soft, soft light day like that. Um, and so. They came in, it took a while till they landed and, and uh, we got a chance to photograph them up close. And I'll just kind of take you through a couple of the images. Remember, I'm always thinking horizontal and vertically, right? You always got to think about that. Especially those of you that like to produce photo books, you can't just shoot horizontals, right? You got to get some verticals in there. 
I like this image. I like showing multiple images uh, or multiple animals in a shot and layering. I wish the guy in the middle would have popped up just a little bit more to give me some separation, but that's okay. You keep working. I saw those beautiful pink flowers again. I thought, oh my gosh, I need to get those pink flowers behind the puffin. And so I'm working, working, working it, bringing some in in the foreground. I've got some in the background. There's a little behavior, right? There's a little moment there. I'm getting him down low, right? I love that, that shot of him just looking low. Again, I'm looking for beautiful foreground color, beautiful background color. I've got some separation. Do you see the separation now? This is working for me. Enough depth of field, probably around F8, to show both of them sharp. Two more portraits here. I've got really nice, nice soft depth of field on this. And then one more, which is the ocean, which is why it's so dark down below. So I know some of you guys are gear nuts. I'm, I can be a gear nut sometimes as well. So I thought I'd show some of what I use. Feel free to take a look. I'm sure B&H would be happy to help you out with that. Uh, I want to thank B&H for asking me or having me and hosting this event. I want to thank Lindblad Expeditions again for, for asking me to be here. It's a pleasure to work with them. And I, most of all, I want to thank you folks for coming out today. So thank you.